Hey, Christina, welcome to the Working With Us podcast. How are you today? Thank you very much, Paul. Happy to be here. Thanks yes. for inviting me. Yeah, it was always a pleasure to talk to Swedes. Uh, like we Norwegians, you know, we, we have a good uh, uh, neighborly uh, friend, uh, relationship up there in the north. So I was like, looking forward to finally getting to know a little bit more in depth about the Swedish uh, culture and the Swedish work culture and the people over there. So hopefully you can give us some insights. Yeah, thank you. I do think that you might know no more about Swedes than we know about Norwegians, but looking forward to this. Yeah, that's an interesting um, observation, I guess. Uh, and it's also very true when you look at it historically, um, the saying that I, so I'm from uh, the, the part of Norway that is really close to the border of Sweden. And I we grew up with a lot of Swedish television and everything growing up when I grew up. So a lot of influences from Sweden, uh, from cultural uh, growing up. So yeah, I think I know quite a lot about the Swedish culture, I, I must say. Yes. So, but it's you gonna be interesting to hear can, from an expert. You can correct me. You can correct me. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe I will have some questions and or I'll ask you to clarify if I have like some my own experience. But that that yeah. could be interesting. Looking forward to that. Yeah. So, um, I wanted to start with the prefix uh, where we where we try to set the Swedish culture in some sort of historical context, um, and. Uh, and because I think it's important to, maybe it's not important, but I think it's very interesting to try to understand a little bit where sort of how culture evolves within a country. A lot of the the interviews I had on this podcast have been on uh, culture that has, that have very stereotypical characters, like the mm. Dutch is very direct and the um, uh, Taiwanese, which I have an episode coming up, is is uh, you know more hierarchical and and all this kind of structure they have inside of the system. So I wanted to hear your thoughts about this and and sort of the the concept of things in Sweden that we we know about and why, like concepts like lagom, mm -hmm. uh, you know the um, mm -hmm. Uh, organizational uh, flat organizational hierarchy and everything where that comes from originally do you know anything about that well i do find that fascinating that question why i see a culture like an iceberg you know the norms and the values the factors that drive your behavior so this although this is this is more anthropology uh, i find it really interesting so in my trainings we don't always have time to discuss this but i find it fascinating so um, you, you mentioned the, the word uh, lagom, which means not too much, not too little. What is the factor that influences that, uh, that behavior? Is it uh, history, religion, uh, industrial history, polit politics, uh, education system, climate, whatever? So there is it maybe the history, uh, maybe even industrial history. So Swedes were maybe also geographically in the center of Scandinavia, trying to be take that middle stand, not too much, not too little. And also like a safe spot in a way. We stayed neutral during the Second World War, for example, which saved us from destruction as different from, from uh, the other Scandinavian countries. So therefore, um, I see this conformist, and maybe that's connected to, to Lagom, and, uh, you know, for example, maybe this is joking aside, but we had middle beer, not too strong, not too light. We have middle milk, melan milk, not too skinny, not too fat. So it's like a safe position or perceived like a safe position, not sticking out. So they sometimes say jokingly that, that Brits know they stick out, French people want to stick out, and Swedes don't want to stick out. So I can see this like having a strong opinion or taking sides. This is maybe connected to this um, logon, and maybe one factor could be be history here. Mm. Yeah, obviously uh, you mentioned that uh, in between thing, and I think so. Obviously, I'm I have a lot of experience with Sweden, and one thing that I always find interesting not not one thing, and many things I find interesting. But if I go to the um, in Sweden, to buy alcohol, you buy the strong alcohol at the Systembolaget, which is like the uh, government-operated uh, uh, liquor stores. But if you go to the normal supermarket, you can buy beer that is 3.5% strong, which is like a little bit, not, it's not 
zero and it's not like strong but it's just in between and sweden yeah. is the only country i know that that's like common and i have friends who buy you know that kind of beer just to enjoy it's not to get drunk yeah. it's just a good beer to drink yeah maybe that's optimal for the swedes yeah <laughs> yeah uh, so, so i think you're, you're really right there is that's fascinating i never thought about that until you said it like this and the other aspect you mentioned obviously is, is the 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 topic we have discussed quite uh, a lot in 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 the podcast with sweden uh, with norway and denmark is the law of jante you know the not sticking out and and how how prevalent is that in sweden i don't know if you know how how i know for for fact being norwegian how it affects us and i know from mm-hmm. the discussion with uh with uh, the expert from Denmark, how it affects them. And how is that in Sweden, the mm, law of Jante? Mm. Good question, good question. So um, it's interesting how that is exists in Denmark, Norway, and, and Sweden, I would say. Um, and the Danish author also having the story in Norway and in Sweden. It's about don't act superior. Don't think that you're superior than anyone else. So... I, it, it's interesting to com- compare, but it's definitely very dominant in Sweden. So you would think with the next generation that will disappear because we're boosting them, they can do anything. Hmm, it's still there. It's always we. It's not how many sc- go- goals I scored. It's the team. So from the daycare center up to the boardroom, you see this Jante law. And uh, since I do a lot of trainings with international talents coming into Sweden, they they get confused and maybe they even ready for the first interview. So how am I supposed to promote myself if I can't, uh, if I'm not allowed to, to be boastful or, or, um, or express my, my strengths. And then I try to say that you can do it, but you have to do it with a Swedish tweak. Uh, you have to say why you're good at something and maybe use a little bit of, downgraders maybe instead of i'm really good at german you would say the swedish way would be like i believe i'm fairly good at german because i used to live in germany for 10 years so it's also this background the fact orientation so the yanti law definitely exists uh it's not a good start to be bragging in sweden whether that's at an early age or young or private life it dominates uh, i think and it's still there um Maybe cultures take a long time to change. Maybe it is changing, but um, I would say it's still there. Mm. And it's actually an interesting, uh, when you think about uh, foreigners, maybe thinking about Swedish personalities, you have one person who is very famous, who is probably the most anti antelo that is, and that's uh, Zlatan Ibrahimovic, mm-hmm. uh, the famous football player, which is Swedish uh, and obviously not um naturally born into sweden uh his family emigrated there when he was young but he is very bragging and self you know out there but obviously knowing him um when he is uh, being interviewed as a swede or as a norwegian i think you see the little bit of a it's there but he still can brag about it i think it's interesting and it's a good example because you see some of the the balkan countries are much more competitive of course uh, maybe this is historical reasons too. So Sweden having this welfare system uh, and more, you know, sharing resources. And in the Balkan countries, you you may, maybe you had to compete, you had to promote yourself. And I want to say that I also believe in the power of diversity. I think we can influence Swedes to be a little bit more promoting. I've heard uh, I've heard comments that Swedes should be a little bit more proud of, for example, corporate culture or the companies. Instead of downgrading, we could maybe promote the company, for example, a little bit more. And talking about Zlatan Ibrahimovic, of course, he's very much admired because he's said to be one of the, or maybe the best world um, football player, one of the best football players in the world. Uh, and some people might admire his, his uh, courage too to promote himself. But as you say, some people might think it's bragging. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Well, it is in some sense, but it's a bragging with a, what's the word for that? Like with a, 
twist like it's nice it's like a fun brag we have also a, a character in norway uh, a skier which is uh very famous peter nortrug i don't know if uh, anyone knows who it is but if you're into cross-country skiing you might know <laughs> it's a very yeah, you do have some cross-country skiers huh, don't you yeah a few uh, some some of some but also sweden has a lot of them that's yeah, a that's a healthy yeah, yeah. competition yeah, they had some yeah. <laughs> good as fun anyways yeah. we're not gonna go that <laughs> that direction today um I want to focus a little bit more back on the. We mentioned a lot of things about the Swedish personality now with the the concept of lagom and lovjant and everything. And if you can sort of like try to now, in your words, um, describe a typical Swedish professional to the listener, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. what would you say? So uh, before I do that, I've learned maybe the hard way to. When I generalize, uh, it's a starting point before you get to know the individual. So here I'm going to describe it a typical Swedish professional. And of course there are exceptions, but as we know with research, it's the average tendency of a group and culture is collective. So I allow myself to generalize, but I still want consensus on the fact that I will do that. So I will generalize as a starting point to say that a typical Swedish professional would be very fact oriented. It was, if you want to convince a Swede about an idea, control your emotions, speak slowly, lower your voice, and present facts. Um, Be on time. Uh, Those are the main things. And I think also focus on the team. It's for the benefit of the team. It's not about me standing out. So um, those are the, the, and also the engineering skills. After all, that built Sweden. So I think maybe that's why we're extremely fact-oriented. So uh, that's how I would generalize when I describe mm. a typical Swede. Are there any, uh, in your training uh, with maybe uh, foreign companies coming into work in Sweden, are there any misconceptions that usually comes up that you sort of have to 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 talk about and try to change? Or maybe somebody's misconception even can be a little bit frustrating because they're so far from, from the reality. Definitely, Paul. And that's uh, that's why I have this fun job uh, and BBI we are called in when sometimes there is a conflict already at the workplace and we see it's not uh, nobody's stupid or right or wrong it's cultural differences so I'm really passionate about uh, identifying these gaps or misconceptions as you say miscommunication so that we can bridge the gaps and benefit from the cultural diversity so yes I see a lot of this and uh, it starts with self-awareness and the Swedes should be aware how we are perceived sometimes. So um, I can give you plenty of examples, of course. So failure stories are also good to take. And um, so there's this vagueness. As I already mentioned, Swedes tend to um, have low key and, and use downgraders, while Americans use more, up, use more upgraders. So... Um, uh, which means that we use perhaps, maybe, et cetera. And uh, Americans use more, um, we would call them exaggerations, but more uh, tougher speech. Okay, so there's this uh, small uh, technical company in southern Sweden, and the Americans have bought it, but they're a bit hesitant about this uh, purchase because all they hear from the Swedes uh, are problems. And they they constantly, when they contact the new Swedish company, they have problems. So they come over to Sweden and they're going to see what what the problems are. And are we really going to keep this uh, very technical company? And luckily, we got to see the Swedish company before the Americans came. And we said we saw clearly the cultural misconception here. It was the fact that. The Swedes don't want to be bragging about the 95% that's good in the company. So they talked about the 5% that that had problems. So that's what the Americans heard. And maybe Swedes also tend to be a little bit more like focus on, we want to see the worst case scenario. It's just not just the, the best case scenario. And maybe we are perceived as a bit of a skeptic. The, uh, skeptical view and also more pessimistic so joking aside but you know that 150 years ago one million people emigrated from sweden to america and maybe they were the optimists and here are we the pessimists yeah <laughs> or maybe it, it could be the power of diversity here too but let's be aware americans tend to be a little bit more risk oriented 
and the Swedes see themselves as more realistic. So we told the Swedish company that now promote the company. It's not about bragging. Talk, present the facts because we we both want to talk about facts and present visions and skip the nine, skip the five percent that's bad. Talk about visions and success stories and say yes I can instead of I will try. So they did. They did go outside the comfort zone, but they widened the comfort zone, and the Americans were happy. We went back home, kept the company, and it was a success. That's so a that's story. one of the misconceptions that I see. And I would love to, to identify these gaps as early as possible, of course. Yeah. And, and is it, it's interesting when you think about, uh, when you talk about companies and the way of promoting themselves, and you think about some of the, the big Swedish companies like IKEA, Volvo, um, Scania, like these companies, I don't really remember ever them every day doing like a lot of heavy marketing and brand. They're good at branding, but like being out there and saying we are the best uh, furniture company. It's just they are the biggest player in it. They don't never really see it. It was sort of like organically just grew into being a big company. The same, I guess, with Volvo through the years, right? So mm-hmm. I don't know if this is uh, probably because if you if you had that, I could done. I I don't know if anyone have done that in Sweden. Probably they have looked at how. IKEA evolved from being uh, someone sitting in a garage making furniture to being this multi, with mm. still the Swedish roots very deeply intact, mm. right? Which is fascinating. Um, yes, and and uh, it's good that you bring up industrial history. I think that can explain also the differences between the Nordic countries, because we we have these this raw material, uh, iron ore and timber steel and and wood pulp and paper industry and that created as you say these huge companies for a small population and maybe you didn't have to promote yourself and um, and also you became um, proud of the engineering skills but i listened to a presentation from one of the former directors at volvo i should mention his name because it's his hopefully i convey I quote correctly and convey his message. He said, Swedes have a tendency of, uh, it's not it's not really possible to, to translate it, but I try, complacent shyness. In Swedish, självgod blygsamhet. And he said, it's good to be proud of the engineering skills, but we mustn't be arrogant thinking the Swedish way is the best way. There's a bi- balance there. So when we sell our products in China, for example, maybe they don't think that Volvo is the best. So let's not be um, let's not be uh, complacent, thinking that we are the best anyway. We don't need to make an effort. And then he said, um, uh, modesty uh, or shyness. He said maybe that's nice. Also in Asia, you're not supposed to you're supposed to be modest. But maybe we have to promote ourselves a little bit more. Maybe China has never heard about Volvo. So he actually said that. So we we work a lot with these big technical companies, of course, in Sweden. And uh, we see that there's exactly what you're saying, uh, this tendency of uh, we are big and we are dominant. And uh, maybe we don't have to promote ourselves as much. As you said. Yeah, and, and I think it's a, a, one of the big case studies in um, cross-cultural uh, management and leadership is, uh, it's, it's not about Sweden, but I was just thinking about the comparison about how IKEA is practically anywhere in the world, but you have something like uh, Walmart, uh, the story about Walmart going into Germany, and it failed completely because they took a culture, very American, and wanted to implement in a German um, uh, like in, in Germany and it failed miserably but the IKEA way of running business universally seems to work really well anywhere you go and it's that's kind of interesting if I go to IKEA I'm in Italy go to IKEA I see the people are sort of trained to be the same everywhere you go I've been to Portugal mm-hmm. IKEA I've been to mm-hmm. many IKEAs and it seems to be a, like a, a culture that's easy to uh, not a culture that's the wrong word but like a way of, uh, of of running a business that is easy to adopt in some sense and, and, and train people into. Is that something that, that makes sense? And uh, I would say they, and, and yeah, definitely. And that's the intention, I think. And now IKEA is not here to explain, but I can say that 
that's the intention to promote the corporate culture of IKEA. And but once again, don't underestimate the national cultural influence on Swedish companies. If you think about it, the business idea of IKEA, it's furniture. Everybody should be able to furnish their homes. We need to furnish our homes. We have big homes but the climate is different, we meet in our homes. And wooden furniture, maybe from the beginning, lots of, fur, lots of uh, timber. And then again, not too expensive, not too cheap, so affordable for everyone, and also efficient packing. So it really uh, relates to all these Swedish values of modesty, equality, efficiency. So it's fine, promote it as IKEA culture, but it's definitely very much of a Swedish culture. And even if you ask for a job at IKEA, if you, I don't know, no HR is here, but if you walk in with your gold necklace and your Gucci bag and, and be bragging, maybe they might tell you that mm, it's not the corporate culture of IKEA. Hmm. But I would say it's a very much of a Swedish culture too. Yeah. No, it will be a fascinating case study. Uh, maybe I will look into that because I think... Uh... Uh, or I will look for someone who has done that research because I'm pretty sure there exists something out there about this. Um, just the, the, the last it's... fact you mentioned there with the the yeah. gold chain. I would I would see the stereotypical Italian, you know, that you said that will go into a corporate job in IKEA. Uh, just for context, uh, just so I can generalize a little bit about the, uh, Italians. There's an episode of Art Italy, so you can listen to it, where she explains that they have this concept of bella figura, which means that you dress up nice, you show off a little bit, and that's accepted. And that's very opposite of a Swedish culture. Yeah. So, and, and it's necessary in a competitive country like uh, Italy to stand out. But in a homogenous small country like Sweden, it, was, it wasn't necessary. But maybe, as I said, maybe we can influence each other to, to enrich uh, the, and create a new culture too. But uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, the role model, the founder of IKEA, Ingvar Kampra, the IK, of course, was a... Uh, uh, was a symbol of that modesty you know the way the old volvo he drove and the the clothes and he said no business class um, and flying and all that so that uh, is dominating the culture still i guess hmm. and and this kind of um, we talked a little bit about the, this modesty and and the way of of, of the, uh, the the swedish professional and Let's change to to thinking about someone who now now is coming to Sweden and maybe wants to settle down with their family or they're going to go for a, an expat mission. How is it to, you know, socialize with the Swedish, make friends with them, and, and just be mm. around them? How do they see? Mm. How, how is the social life for someone in Sweden in yeah. general? So Sweden is there's a lot of surveys on this on expat life, and Sweden is a tough country to move to. I mean, I say to my Indian talents moving to Sweden. I say you don't you don't move to Sweden because of the food or the climate. You move to Sweden in spite of the food and the climate. And maybe the work-life balance, for example, that's an attraction, even if it's confusing sometimes. But I do think when we talk about social life in Sweden, it is difficult. And I would it would help. Uh, I try to give certain pieces of advice, of course. If you visualize Swedes, like not only the engineer that we talked about, the obsessed engineer with the perfect product, but also the coconut. Now, in cultural discussions, uh, people know about this metaphor of a peach and the coconut. So Swedes are very much the coconut culture, like the hard shell. So like you said, the Walmart uh, Im implementing the peach culture where you say, hello, how are you? What can I do for you? didn't work in Germany, and they still haven't opened in Sweden or Finland either. So this is uh, a bit intrusive. So we have a privacy, we have the, 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 the shell. So why do you smile at me? I don't know you. And it is hard to get uh, uh, beneath, uh, beyond that uh, hard shell. But once you are there, we are friends. While of course the peach culture, we have to be fair here, there's a hard bit in the middle. So there are miscommunication, there's miscommunication here as well. And yes, uh, I do say to people moving to Sweden, you need patience. We do have feelings, even if uh, we do have feeling the empathy, empathy, even if we are supposed to control our feelings, they are there. And one way of opening that door or that shell 
would be to ask for help. So even if I do full day trainings, maybe this is the best piece of advice, whether it's uh, privately or at the workplace. Because if you ask for help in Sweden, not only is it necessary because nobody will help you unless you ask for help, because it's self-reliance. If I run up to you and say, oh, I see you look a little bit helpless, then I'm insinuating that you cannot cope on our own. And that's how we educate our kids. You cope on your own. You have this independent mind and you choose religion, political party, university yourself. Um, very confusing for others. So therefore, uh, I will ask, uh, I will uh, advise them to ask for help. Because that could, and then it's universal, I think, even Swedes would help you. But only if you ask for help. And then another win-win um, with uh, the fact that this uh, situation, if you ask for help, is that if you ask for help, whether it's in the food store, ask for the best cheese, or at the workplace, you need help. Then you are humble because you admit that you don't know. Vulnerability is actually perceived as something positive. So uh, you're humble and you're honest. You may say honesty is important in all cultures, yeah. But the opposite, falseness or cheating, it's the quickest way of losing trust in Sweden if it turns out that you lied or you're cheating. So it is important. And honesty, we know why you recruited, but here, you ask for help. Hmm. You're honest. And thirdly, you ask for help. So you're a team player. Oh, we like you. So just by asking for help, you're humble, honest, and a team player. And then you touch upon three important values for Swedish people. So um, then again, about socializing, um, yeah, um, patient, don't push it, and uh, ask for help. And don't also don't judge if people. If Swedes don't show emotions, uh, it's because of culture. Of course, hmm. it could be personality too. Yeah, yeah, of course, we have all different. And as I said earlier, there, uh, I think in many cultures, there, uh, especially also in Sweden, there's a lot of uh, uh, second generation immigrant, immigrants, and they have a different, like the, a lot of people from the Balkans that created a different personality. That's why, as you said earlier, generalization is very difficult when it comes to the to, to culture because there are so many backgrounds that is the inner layer of a personality that's been developed uh, but yeah I, I see what you say there and I think also I want to mention this because what you're talking about is also very prevalent in both we uh, Norway and Denmark is that with freedom comes the responsibility right that that's sort of the essence of what you're saying here like you, you we are giving you all this freedom society is giving you and then from your as a child, you do your homework by yourself. And if you need help, you can ask, but they don't expect you to ask for help. You can figure it out yourself. So uh, okay. it, it, that exists all over Scandinavia. And it's very interesting how and that maybe sort of... it's connected to, to your high trust culture. According to surveys, Scandinavian cultures have a high trust culture. It's not only trust in the state and authorities, it's also interpersonal trust. So uh, it's connected to that. and. Uh, that uh, the consequences are this individual freedom connected with individual responsibility. Yeah. yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about what, because I, I think it's interesting um, to understand a little bit of how uh, back to social life, because if uh, a lot of times, especially uh, from personal experience, when I move to another country or live in another culture, it's difficult to, I could bring on what I like to do as a sort of after work activity or even how I behave in the workplace and things I want to do like lunch culture, for example, or socializing at the workplace or socializing after the workplace. So what's like the general way of for a Swede to look at a a week of normal work it, it, yeah. outside of holidays how do they spend a day yeah uh, yeah, yeah. so we plan the days we plan the days according to the kids activity and to the weather you have to have five weather apps so you don't go to ikea if it's sunny so we we start talking this is a good uh, small talk you start planning the weekend on wednesday and then the most common question on monday is how was your weekend and maybe this is connected to the work-life balance focus, which is my, my free time is as important as my work, but I handle that uh, balance myself, like we're saying. 
So um, to socialize after work is not that common. Even if you love or like your colleagues, uh, you have different socialize in different bubbles. That's also why I say what I say to people moving to Sweden. You have to create your own bubbles because don't expect the the company to organize things for you. We try to do that. We even have a, a word for it. You know, in Brazil, you can just go out with your colleagues. You don't need a word for it. But Swedes have to schedule it. So we have a word not just for fika. It's a spontaneous activity, isn't it? But it's scheduled spontaneity, the coffee breaks. And we even have a newer word, well, RV. We call it RV. But it really is. Have you heard of that, Paul? No, that's new for me as well. So all Swedes know about it. And RV is really a weird word in a way, because RV, we don't use W. So it should be AW or RW. But we say RV. And what we mean is, after work activity so it's like a concept that the swedes have innovated and they we might think it's an american thing but it's not so it's um, now i'm i exaggerate a little bit but it's like a an activity where you can actually skip work and you schedule it and now we're going to be spontaneous and we can also have some alcohol and it could be a thursday Okay, wild and crazy for the Swede. So we call it RV, and that would be to go out, um, have a drink, could be alcohol, uh, with your colleagues, uh, and maybe even on a Thursday, not just Friday, Saturday. Actually, not on a Saturday. So it's connected to work, and that's, of course, take part in those activities. So join the coffee breaks and join those RV activities, because that's the moment when Swedes get a little bit more extrovert, maybe. Uh, but otherwise, uh, if I try and answer your question, I think the Swedes really try to, or well, try to, we have these different bubbles, whether it's connected to your dog's activities or your kids' activities or your own sports or hobbies or singing in a choir. So, and those different bubbles, they networks, they don't often, they don't always meet. So if you want to get to know Swedes, you need to go into one of those uh, spheres or, or bubbles i would say yeah and and is it also like um uh, as you as you mentioned which is which is i think it's a very interesting for a lot of cultures outside of, of sweden and scandinavia is that when work ends it usually it ends much earlier than it does a lot of other parts of the world like i don't know when sort of a normal time in sweden is would it be like four four five p.m then it's sort of is it is it a, an activity like dinner and an activity or is it uh, then you have the Ave? Or, and is that Ave only for the weekends? Or can you do that sort of during the yeah. weekdays? It's, I like uh... your question. I like when we say why. And I think it's interesting you in neighboring country asking uh, to clarify for clarification. I think it's great. I love the why. Uh, because it makes me aware that it, once again, it's not universal. And it's not even... Uh, understood in Norway. So talk about the work hours. So uh, we do have this high trust, the work-life balance focus, and we wouldn't stay at the office just because the manager is there. We don't might not even know who the manager is. Um, and, and then I say to, to ambitious, competitive people coming into Sweden for their career, not for the food or the climate, for their career. And, uh, you know, how can I have a meeting? There's no Swede at the office at three o'clock. They're all gone on a Friday, on a Friday, maybe four, three, four o'clock on a Friday. And then I'll say to them, be happy you're not in Norway because nobody's at the office after 12 on Friday. <laughs> so you are correct. Too much. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but then some people might object and say, no, the, the, co the corporate culture in Sweden is very competitive now. So for sure, we work more than 40 hours. Yeah, you might do that, but the, the perception of working hard is different. So uh, this Indian uh, um, girl, very talented uh, uh, manager, she said, uh, yeah, in, in India, that was part of, my, of me climbing the career ladder to work the 50 hours. And I knew I would be called into the office and get a promotion that I counted on that. That was my plan. And in Sweden and Norway, I would say it's more like, oh, you're working 50 hours. We want you to, we don't want you to get to burnout. We want sustainable labor. And also insinuating, maybe the Norwegians will say it, but Swedes won't say it. 
but it's in a thing, oh, you're not time efficient. You're working more than 40 hours. So we accept that people go home. And also maybe this is a misconception as well that, yeah, so, so we might meet, uh, leave four o'clock, hopefully not in the middle of a strategic meeting because we have to be aware how that's perceived, but still we can leave and pick up the kids at the daycare centers because usually both parents work and you have this scheduled day and then the kids are in bed and you might work in the evening. So this is what you said about individual freedom and responsibility. So this could be a misconcept that we don't work hard, but we work hard maybe even in the evening. Yeah. No, I think it's a very important uh, for for a listener uh, from, from outside to see that it's not about, and I think go back to also the not about bragging, like working too many hours can be seen as bragging. Look at me, how hard I'm working. And it can be, as you said, looked down upon. You should be more efficient with your time uh, and you, we are giving you, I'm talking, I say we, we give you all this response, uh, this freedom. So you take your own responsibility and we want them. I think also that's uh, something that is true with Sweden. Like work life balance is important and it's become very important in the last two, three decades about like giving people time to, you know, reset and, 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 and sort of relax and, and spend time with the family and then get back to work. And they're happier when they come back to work on Monday, if they had like a, a good weekend off right so yeah that's the idea and of course even if it's confusing for others it could also be an attraction to work for certain companies who have this acceptance to stay at home if your child is home uh, is sick for example yeah 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 so if if uh, you mentioned a little bit about um uh, sort of careers and everything and, and and you mentioned that the example with the indian woman uh how they sort of see me working hard is evidence for my manager to give me a promotion so how does the swede look at career what sort of is a good thing to do at the workplace to give you a promotion yeah. or to, to grow into the system or is that even a thing is that a is that something that they would like to do to sort of have a, a an opportunity to grow into become the the manager or ceo of a mm. company yeah two good questions because uh is it is is it desirable do we aspire to become the manager we don't even have a word for aspire in swedish really so what does it mean do i work more have more have less free time manage more people maybe more problems uh, do i have a, a higher salary do i pay more tax so a lot of um, factors uh, to consider and there are surveys about this uh, whether that's uh, a trigger to motivate swedes or not um, and also the other day I got the question from, from a foreigner working in a Swedish team. And she said, it's all about being a team. And how can I differentiate myself? Because I want to make a career. So I think it was an excellent question. And somebody else in the audience actually answered. And, and he said immediately, yeah, you, it shines through if you're a good team player. And you share information, you support each other. And it will shine through. You will get your promotion. And then I add to that that um, you have to plan your own career. You might not get that promotion. You have to show that you take initiatives, uh, think outside the box, and, 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 and plan your own career. So that's what I believe in. Uh, and of yeah. course you can, but it could be tricky for, for uh, foreigners moving to Sweden and wanting to make a career because they feel a bit restless and i'm i'm actually passionate about capitalizing on this drive that the scandinavian countries get from people from other countries with more competitive cultures this drive so let's uh, bridge the gap here uh, if you have this drive take initiatives ask for feedback ask for promotions even or trainings whatever you want and the swedish managers should also be a little bit more present and make sure you capitalize on this drive and ambition. Mm. Because one, one more thing, Swedes who go abroad, they do it mainly for the adventure of the family. But the majority that we meet, they come to Sweden for the career. So don't forget that the trigger even there is different why mm. you move. Yeah. And, and I think uh, if you are listening to this uh, and you are from a, a culture where you, 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 you're sort of... Uh, 
you know that from because the colleagues you work with it's all about the hours you put into work like basically the hours you stay mm -hmm. that's not the case right it's more about what you do in the hours you're given or the hours you take right you take the hours you need to make an output instead of just I know I, I just as a personal anecdote I used to live in Portugal and I I, I studied actually HR in Portugal uh, learn a lot about the Portuguese work culture and they actually make offices don't know if that's true anymore but they used to make offices with uh, a resting a room to rest when you didn't have anything more to do so you can spend the last hour before you clocked out like it was so important to stay until mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. like 6 p.m or whatever they left yeah. even if you had nothing more to do they had a room where you can go and play pool and, and, and mm -hmm. sit down mm -hmm. so it was all about like showing um mm. top management that you clocked out after 6 p.m mm. even though you have nothing more to do mm. which seems very inefficient but it's just the way mm. they're different sort of context talking. yeah yeah different context for sure it, so that's Swede, not to... yeah it, uh, adding to the, what you're saying the swede said to the indian uh, uh, team member he said uh, oh it's friday evening why do you work so late it's four o'clock now five o'clock let's say five o'clock you should go home and care for your family and the indian guy said that's what i do i care for my family that's why i'm here hmm. so different contexts of course yeah and, and uh, i just also want bad to, or, yeah. yeah 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 for sure it's a different context and but i also wanted to mention uh, a friend of mine although in norwegian uh, we, we share very similar culture he he used to work in a finance sector in london and he he actually adopted the culture there of staying late at work because it was important mm. for potential promotions mm. within the company, mm. even though mm. as a Norwegian, he will probably go out and do a, a run yeah. in the park, you know, at 4 p.m. But he stayed until 6 p.m., even though there was nothing to do, just to, so mm. he can have evidence mm. for his manager that he was working mm. late. And that was a mm. good good thing. Which So mm. London, UK, yeah. not that far. You don't have to again say that it's uh, like the South of Europe culture is that way or this way. It's... It, these kind of bubbles of culture yeah, exist everywhere. Yeah, but I do. It's a good thing to bring up and to clarify. And I think the Scandinavian countries are the exceptions here, um, and we have to be aware that uh, it's even contraproductive. I would say, at least in this flat management style in Gothenburg where I am, it's even contraproductive if uh, the manager says, "I would like you to stay at the office until five o'clock today." This would uh, be um, they would ins this would inspire the challenging Swede to do the opposite. That's why I would go home or take an even longer coffee break, whatever. So it's even contraproductive to insinuate that you do something to please the manager. Uh, you, so how do you trigger a Swede to work harder? Well, in Sweden they say you don't you have neither a whip nor a carrot so you can't really fire people it's actually even easier in Denmark than in Sweden um, so because of job security good or bad but safe security you keep your job we, we it's really difficult to fire someone so you can't threaten with that and then the carrot mm, how much carrots do you have can you raise the salary yeah but we have this tax system where the taxes are progressive etc and then the yante law on top of that if you buy that fancy car your neighbors might look down on you so maybe this is disappearing a little bit but it's still interesting so therefore uh, it's even counterproductive if you insinuate that you should do it because i'm telling you i'm the boss the swede would do the opposite and we perceive that as micromanagement and this is the quickest way of of getting rid you don't need to fire them they leave the swedes leave we we know it's not that we dislike micromanagement, we we are allergic to it, and we perceive you could say the whole world is allergic to micromanagement. Yeah, but the level where it's perceived, it's much quicker. So even if you say I'd like you to be there, mm, how do you know what what I, what plans I have before Tuesday? Hmm. Yeah, exactly. And I think this is a uh, it was one of the questions I would have for you as well is how do you motivate uh, if you have a Swedish person on your team, he, he, a lot of my my um, my network and maybe listeners as well is they they run companies that are remote first and they hire people from from around the world. And if they are looking to hire someone from Sweden, I think it's just exactly what you mentioned. You have to uh, because I think I think that 
companies that do hire people from different cultures need to have awareness of how how it works for individuals so if you put like a system where there's a lot of check-ins during the day a lot of you know micromanagement you basically will turn them off and they will look for other opportunities right yes exactly so uh so be aware of that uh, because we want to optimize our teams and uh, be aware i think what you said also be aware all of us how we are perceived and maybe it's not even reality but it's, but it's how we are perceived and the uh, swedish culture is uh, is extreme in many ways yeah yeah um no i, I mean it's super fascinating and i think uh, now we are getting a good picture of, of a, a swedish professional and then how it is to work and live in sweden at least on the on the on the contextual level i mean there, there's better ways to learn about this by being there for example you will learn more more um, practical experience is always the best uh, um, but say that you are working now um, as a manager you're not from Sweden maybe you're looking at going into Sweden uh, maybe you're a business owner you want to expand into Sweden uh, or maybe you just want to hire someone from Sweden what would be the what would a, a person generalizing again very much from Sweden mm-hmm. what would they bring to a intercultural a multicultural team if you if you put like a swedish person on a team and they are a mix of different cultures what would their sort of strength be okay, in that okay. team okay so that's i like that the power of cultural diversity what how can we optimize each other's strengths and and maybe like you said italians are a little bit more competitive so you have this ambition and drive so we need to to capitalize on that and what can swedes contribute with I think we have this idea of thinking outside the box. That's what we taught when we are young. Take your own initiative, think outside the box. And maybe here again, maybe we are so good at thinking outside the box. So we are so obsessed about thinking outside the box. We don't even know what the box looks like anymore. So maybe we have this uh, German team worker who's uh, expert on the box. So this is the power of diversity here. So I think we're good at taking out on initiatives and whether, you know, it's always good and bad with every cultural behavior, but Sweden is high on innovation. So is that because we can challenge superiors? We don't get fired because we admit a mistake uh, or we say to the manager that you are wrong. So we had direct communication up and indirect down the opposite to the rest of the world. So we, when we challenge superiors like Pippi Longstocking, Greta Thunberg, it's perceived as disrespectful, maybe, but the, the good thing is that you you maybe can open up for the company's um, weaknesses. And, and uh, that could maybe be beneficial, this challenging superiors uh, for innovation for a company. And I also think that you can, you can trust the Swede. Uh, so here's a typical Swinglish communication, if I may say. So we speak English, but in a Swedish way. So the Swedish manager says to the other Swede, uh, we forget, please, by the way, we are perceived as very rude. We don't open the door for you because you can open the door yourself. And we don't use please in the Swedish language, really. So I forget please, too, when I speak English. So the Swede says to the other one, we don't want to be bossy. So we wrap up the order as a question. So could you maybe write this report by Tuesday if you feel like it, maybe if you have the time? perhaps. And then there's some silence, and silence is positive for a Swede. It means I respect your question, and I don't want to lie. Lying is taboo. So I make sure I can fix that on Tuesday. So then I say, I will try. And I translate that into English. This means write that order on Tuesday. Yes, I promise. But it's perceived as a vague, vague answer. I even worked with actually with an Italian company that said, we can't keep you as a supplier. Because whenever I ask if you can deliver, you say, I will try. But I translated to the Italian, I said, this means they will do it. Well, to me, it sounds like more like a vague no, a diplomatic no. So we think we speak global English, but in Swinglish, I will try is closer to a yes. But in Italian English, I will try is maybe closer to diplomatic way of saying, I don't think I will do it. (laughs) And I will try what it means in Gothenburg English, the, the answer I will try, it means like this. I promise I will do that report for Tuesday 
And if I don't do it, I will get back to you and inform you. And don't you dare to micromanage me before Tuesday. Leave me alone in the, in the meantime. <laughs> Oh my god, uh, this this hits a little bit home to me as well because I'm I'm with an Italian and I have a, I think in Norway we have a little bit of a similar way of thinking or saying. So it's this is a breeding ground for a lot of uh, smaller you know discussions that we have because we I can would say, say I'm... marriages, Paul. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, but it's, a, it's, it's not I will... personality is culture. It is culture. It's culture. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a constant learning experience. You never, you never fully educated in these things. So it's super interesting. Okay. Um, I wanted to, uh, to ask you. I don't know if you. Um, I, I, I sent this question in, in advance, so maybe you had time to think about this because I, I know that now I have talked to uh, an expert from Norwegian culture, Danish culture, and now you're from Swedish culture. <laughs> You probably don't do much training with Danish or Norwegian companies, but do you have any, or you do, that's good if you do, but is there any thing that sets Sweden apart within the Scandinavian context? If you think about Norway, Denmark and Sweden up against each other, that, that maybe a listener could find interesting because yeah. I think for a lot of people outside the sea, I hear, I hear that a lot. They, 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 they know I'm from Norway, but they say you're from Sweden, right? It's like they, they don't really all the time see the difference between those three countries mm. but we do yeah and, and i think your question is really relevant because it they are seemingly similar the neighbors and you you um, you don't you're not prepared for the culture shock because you think we have the same history as scandinavia and that's when the culture shock could be harder because you don't expect it so we actually do a lot of trainings uh, about scandinavian differences because we mustn't minimize them um, so what sets sweden apart maybe because of historical reasons are we a little bit we talked about this at the beginning a little bit more conformist not sticking out for example the danes of course you know they they perceive as much more frank and they think that we are vague i can't trust you you don't tell it like it is and we say to the danes are you too frank you are rude with me and maybe we can benefit from that difference too but we need to be aware of it uh, for the Norwegians, you, you tell me, but I think there's a little bit more frankness too, and uh, a little bit less of conformism. Um, that's what I would say. And a little bit of even softer culture. I don't know if you, we could remember the Hofstede dimensions about the soft and tough culture, masculinity, femininity, and Sweden is extreme there. We soften the language, we soften the orders, uh, it's compromise, consensus, cooperation. Uh, so there I see Sweden being a little bit more soft and a little bit more indirect in communication style. And I think there's a little, in Nova, I think there's a little bit more acceptance that the manager decides, at least in, in Finland, there's a little more acceptance. In Denmark, it's not that they, they accept that the manager decides above your head, but it's more action orientation. So yeah, go on, just go ahead with it. So when they built the bridge between Denmark and Sweden, one of the differences was the, the process oriented Swede, big companies, consensus. We set all the details, sitting in meetings, and then the Danes started digging before the Swedes and they wondered what are the Swedes doing on the other side? And we're sitting in meetings and then we started and the Danes a little bit more, no less big companies started to to construct the bridge before the, the 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 Swedes and maybe stopped a bit get backwards a little bit and then we met in the middle of the bridge with two different methods oh. so there were some uh, differences that I think we need to clarify even between uh, uh, the Scandinavian cultures yeah very relevant. yeah and, and 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 I think everything you're saying is completely correct. And I I want to say one thing just also from from the context that I'm Norwegian is that I think that uh, the Norwegians is a much more a culture where they are very proud of being Norwegian, so they stay mm -hmm. in Norway for like I don't read I traveled all over the world and I lived mm -hmm. with very few Norwegians. I meet very few Norwegians abroad. I met a lot of I meet a lot of Swedish people. I meet a lot of mm -hmm. Danish people. Uh, they are a little bit because could be the social welfare system that is is very similar across Scandinavia but in Norway it's, it's a little bit different the also got the all the money from from the oil has 
developed a sort of a very mm. protective culture, not part of the EU, for example, you know, we're not part of the, so I think that's also an important distinction yes. to make there. You, you can see yeah, it. In, and, uh, and the... uh, like you further geographically further north and more independent, uh, not in EU and all that. And that's maybe, and also exposed to threat more than wars, more than Sweden. So maybe that has created this uh, more of a patriotism and if one sign of being uh, patriotic is that's how you celebrate your national day, mm. the, the, the 6th of June, the National Day of Sweden, was not even a holiday re uh, before. And of course, as you said, the 17th of May is celebrated all over the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, it's a big deal. And, um, and uh, another, uh, just as an interesting um, observation uh, you, you can make is how, how we do um, lunch, lunch culture. Yeah. It's very different in Sweden and Norway, at least. I'm not 100% sure about how it is in Denmark uh, now. But I know that, for example, in Sweden, you do go out for a hot lunch. Uh, the restaurants, uh, bars, uh, that's, that's, if you work in a professional setting. In yeah. Norway, it's, you, you, you have your food from home and you eat it by the desk in 15 yeah. minutes. Yeah, and, yeah, um, yeah, so that you can go home at four and have your family time. Yeah, exactly. Because how, how can you possibly eat two hot meals a day? No, it no, is no. It is possible. <laughs> I... <laughs> and it's also being a team play, getting together at that lunch hour. But that's uh, that's good to be aware of, and we can explain why. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, the, 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 this is also a way of I think uh, if you're coming from outside of of thinking about. The way of socializing that at least in in Sweden you have that opportunity to sit down at lunch with someone because it's very common to do it at the workplace, mm -hmm. um, which in Norway is less common. There's more companies doing it now. Obviously, uh, they have like work uh, uh, cafeterias at workplace and stuff to do that. But it it, it I think yeah. uh, from yeah. my experience uh, being in Sweden uh, doing some seminars and 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 uh, many years ago it's like this lunch it was. Mm -hmm completely packed you know the restaurants yeah. during lunch hours yeah. and, and, and and you know here we talk about cultural differences norway sweden relative the aspect of food and lunch and time and there's a difference and then you can imagine the difference to brazil for example where food is important for relationship building and there the swedes are perceived in brazil as oh you're so fact oriented why don't you spend these this one hour with me don't you want to get to know me so be aware, Norwegians going to Brazil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh I, I used to live in, in Brazil a little bit. So yeah, you anyway, did. Different, different conversation. Yeah, you did. Um, so we're getting up to the hours and I have a, just a couple of more things to, to ask you. And um, the first thing is um, Sweden, obviously, popular culture is, is a big thing. We talked, I wanted to mention it earlier when you talked about the Swedish mentality. And I think creativity is one thing that you really have. You have a lot of really big, Music, uh, musical uh, bands like ABBA is obviously the one that comes to mind first but in general movie directors like film stars and everything super culture so I think that if someone wants to learn more about Sweden is there anything you can point them to that is like typical Swedish uh, that if you're not in Sweden that you should look at maybe it could be a movie a series something to mm -hmm. listen to something to read about yeah, um, to begin with, I think it's the best way of bridging gaps is to get to know the Swedes, of course, to get an understanding, be curious. <clears throat> There's a lot of literature, actually lots of books about the crazy Swedes, and that will help. I have a whole list uh, on LinkedIn about books and, and then films. I watched a TV series called Welcome to Sweden. It was uh, contrasting uh, the US and Sweden but still very good uh, about the Swedish culture. So um, the more films and books you read about Sweden and the more you interact with Swedes and uh, ask these uh, curious questions, the more we can, this, the more stereotypes wither, I, I, I quote uh, and say. So I really believe in getting to know uh, the individual so that we can bridge the gaps, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, 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 and that's as I said, there there's so many really good um, uh, movies, Swedish made movies that tells a lot about the culture. I know from from watching them myself, obviously being uh, from a place in Norway, very close to the Swedish border, uh, where basically also different cultures, Stockholm, Gothenburg, you, you all know how they are different there. Even if you see a movie set in Stockholm and you see a movie set in 
in uh, Got Gothenburg is like they can be very different uh, yes. styles. Yeah, um, that's another seminar about regional differences. Of <laughs> course, they exist. But like we said, from the outside, people can even see Scandinavia as one culture. Yeah, exactly. One, so, should, one should consider that, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Um, well, uh, we've been talking for almost an hour. Uh, before we end it, uh, first of all, thank you very much for your time. And now I want to to, to let the listeners uh, try to find you online and connect with you and, and BBI, if, if that's uh, something they would like to explore more. So, so how what's the best way of getting in touch with you? I think with BBI and myself uh, through LinkedIn, I think it's a great uh, tool to expand your network and exchange ideas. And I, I find it very useful, LinkedIn. Yeah. Yeah. So it's uh, Christina. BBI communication. Yeah. Yeah. And your your personal LinkedIn as well, obviously. Christina yeah. Rundkrans. Christina so. dot Rundkrans. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I will link all of this in the description of the episode, so so anyone listening or, or watching this can can find all the information, also all the details about Christina you will find there. And anything you want to add in the end that you haven't been able to talk about that you wanted to talk about or any thoughts? I can add one misconcept uh, as well. I was in the US doing a six-hour workshop on Swedish business culture, and the conclusion was that the Americans said, you Swedes, you under-promise and over-deliver. And I said, isn't that good? Under promise. We say eight weeks and we deliver after six weeks. No, it's it's lack of commitment. It's better to say six weeks and maybe even extend it. There's lack of commitment from the Swedes. And then uh, over deliver. Isn't that good? We exceed your expectations. No, said the Americans. We, if we order two screws, we don't want four screws. Uh, so, et cetera. So you have this perfect, the engineer that wants the perfect product and you have a more um risk oriented or ready to launch uh, uh side from the americans so be aware about these uh, differences that's my no i mean that's advice. an that's an excellent uh, example to end this conversation uh, about a very like a very clear cultural difference between a very big culture as american i think that if if you are if you're from a, a us work culture and you, you want to comment on this i would love to to hear what your yeah. opinion about this why why is it really like this and i haven't talked to someone from the us yet but uh, it, i would be curious to to hear the the answer to this basically from from the americans in the end okay perfect thank you very much um enjoy the rest of your day and um, you too. Find the episode on workingwithus.co uh, and it will be on all podcast platforms and on YouTube as a video. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you very much, thank Paul. You, Thanks for inviting me. Bye-bye. Have bye -bye. a nice day. Have a nice day.